Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 3, Hiranyakashipu's plan to become immortal. Text number 32. Tvatakparam naparam apyaye ne jad. Vyatirikatam asti. Vedyakalaste tanavascha sarava. Hiranyagarabho si brihatri prishta. Tvatakparam naparam apyane jad. Etachit kinchit vyati vyati rik tam asti vedyakalas te tanavas jasarava hiranyagarabho si brihatri prishta Yakalaste Tanabas to Sar Vidyakalaste Tanabas to Sarava Hiranyagarbo si Brihat Pratishta Chanshke Tvatakparam Naparam Apyayeda Etachakinchid Yati Kurik Damasti Vidyakalaste Tanavas Jasarava Nayagarbo Si Brihat Pratishta Tvatak from you Param higher Na not Aparam lower Api even Anejat not moving Ajat moving Cha and Kinchit anything Yatiriktam separate Asti there is Vidya knowledge Kala its parts Te of you Tanava features of the body Cha and Sarva all Hiranyagarbha the one who keeps the universe within his abdomen Asti, you are. Brihat, greater than the greatest. Tri Prishta, transcendental to the three modes of material nature. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. There is nothing separate from you, whether it be better or lower, stationary or moving. The knowledge derived from the Vedic literatures like the Upanishads and from all the sublims of the original Vedic knowledge 
form your external body. You are Haranya Garbha, the reservoir of the universe. But nonetheless, being situated as the supreme controller, you are transcendental to the material world, which consists of the three modes of material nature. Purport. The word param means the supreme cause, and apara means the effect. The supreme cause is the supreme personality of Godhead, and the effect is material nature. The living entities, both moving and non-moving, are controlled by the Vedic instructions in art and science, and therefore they're all expansions of the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the center as the super soul. The Brahmandas, the universes, exist during the duration of a breath of the Supreme Lord, yes, yaika nishvasita kalam atavalamya Jivanti Lama Vilaja Jagadandanata. Thus, they are also within the womb of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Maha Vishnu. Nothing, therefore, is separate from the Supreme Lord. This is the philosophy of Achintya Beta Beta Tattva. Ete Changsa Kala Pumsam. And she was that verse about how Krishna spread everywhere. How does that start? Just like fire is in one place. Ta Vinsris Iyata. It goes Parasha Shakti Vividaiva Shu Yate. So Bhavaki. E Kadesha Sita Yagya Jotish Vishtrasam Vishti. Parasya Brahmana Shakti Sate Dam Akalam Jaga Ekadesha Sita Yagya. Just like fire is in one place, Jyoti Sam, it, but it spreads its rays everywhere. So, Brahmasya, Parasya Brahmana Shakti, so the Supreme Person is in one place and he is expanding his energies everywhere. Ek, uh, Eka desha, eka desha, sita, ya, jagnea, jyotisa, jyotisa? Jyotisna. Jyotisna, vistarisi, yata, parasya brahmana shakti, sitedam, akilam, jaga. So just like fire is in one place and spreads its rays everywhere, so the Supreme Person is in one place and by his energies he's expanding everywhere. So Hiranyakashipu is ex- continuing his flattery of Brahma because if you flatter someone, you're more likely to get what you want from them. If you tell it was actually on your mind, my dear Brahma, please give me some benedictions because I'd really like to kill you and take over your position. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Sometimes it happens that someone is so liberal that when Duryodhana, when Dronacharya was approached by the, the son of uh, uh, Tristadumya, his father was, what was the name of the king? Drupada, 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 had a fight with uh, Dronacharya. Dronacharya was a Brahmin, and Drupada, King Drupada, was a Kshatriya. But they went to Guru Kul together and became friends. And one day, Drupada, in his friendship, promised half the king to Dronacharya. So when Dronacharya was growing up, well, Dronacharya had some children. One of them wanted some milk, but Dronacharya was so poor he couldn't even give his child any milk. Imagine that, you're such a powerful Brahmin, (laughs) you still can't even give a little bit of milk. Somehow or another, he was in poverty-stricken condition, and therefore he decided he could approach his friend 
Draupada, King Draupada, for a little donation, and Draupada laughed and wouldn't give him anything. So Dronacharya became very angry. He did a sacrifice, and he got two children. One of them was Dristadumya, and the other one was Draupadi, and they were born to destroy the Kshatriya race, such as the wrath of a Brahmin. Even the wrath of the Brahmin can't get even a a glass of milk. (laughs) I mean, things times must have been economically pretty depressed back there. (laughs) In any case, later on, Dristadumya was entrusted to Dronacharya to teach him the science of Dhanurveda, the science of fighting. And uh, Dronacharya was so liberal, he trained up Dristadumya, although he knew that in the future this Shatru was born to kill him. So that's quite liberal. Now Brahma, I don't, doesn't appear. Maybe he knows what's going on. I'm sure he knows what's going on because the demigods told him. But still, he, he, he gave, first of all, he gave Harinikashipu a body which was indestructible. But then again, if you're so powerful to give someone a body that's indestructible, you could probably destroy it. <laughs> so no worries there. And of course, as we'll find out shortly, maybe even today, that well, he keep on. He gives him a lot of praise. He's asking for a big, but he's going to get a hundred benedictions. So you got to really flatter someone. I mean, for someone to even sit, be in the sky where, wherever Brahma was and listen to a hundred benedictions, it's pretty boring. It gets a little boring after a while, especially after the fiftieth benediction. It's hard to keep track what this person wants. In any case, he he goes through the whole thing and he grants them everything. So Hiranyakashipu's flattery paid off. And here the flattery is that supposedly Brahma is everywhere, but we know Krishna is everywhere. And Brahma, he may be very powerful. He has some special powers. He has all mystic power within this universe, but not on the level of Krishna. We don't see Brahma in every atom. Of course, we don't see every atom either, but (laughs) if we could, we wouldn't see Brahma there. And then the person who is in every atom, andanta rasta paramanu chayanta astam, within him, he's in every atom, and within him is all the universes. And within all the universes, he's everywhere. So try to figure that out. There's an infinite regress. Krishna is in every atom and every universe, and within Krishna is every universe. So how to, how to figure that out? And within every universe, that's within Krishna. Krishna is in every atom in that universe. And within every atom in that universe that's within Krishna is Krishna is within that atom, and within him are all the universes. So where does it end? Anyone can say? You'd have to ask Krishna where it all ends, if it ends at all. Not easy to become God. (laughs) Even to try to fit into one atom would be rather difficult. Or to speak of expanding yourself into two or three atoms. We couldn't even do that. What to speak of every atom in every universe. Eternally, in no past, present, future, It's quite difficult. We can't remember what happened yesterday. What about our three trillion lifetimes ago? Anyone can remember? We don't even know what species of life we were in. We can't even probably don't know everyone's name in the room here. And yet Krishna, he knows everything past, present, and future. Every atom and every, in the ocean and every drop of water. He even knows the name of every shark that's in the ocean. (laughs) So that's inconceivable, and therefore no one could actually even come close to Krishna's potency. But Harinikashipu is flattering Brahma. I don't know how Brahma is taking this whole thing. It's not really revealed. But at the end, 
he gets a hundred benedictions. So the next verse, O my Lord, being changelessly situated in your own abode, you expand your universal form within this cosmic manifestation. Thus appearing to taste the material world, you are Brahman, the super soul, the oldest, the personality of Godhead. Now, Brahma is either he's very tolerant, <laughs> because when Narada Muni told Brahma, you know, it seems like you hold the whole universe within the, with your fist, and Brahma became very disturbed at his son saying that. He said, actually, I'm not God. I'm, I'm simply the servant of God. But here, Arani Kashipu is really flattering Brahma, telling him he's God. And Brahma doesn't, see, there's no, he's not saying anything so far. As a matter of fact, he doesn't say anything. He just gives him the benedictions and then just leaves. It is said that the absolute truth appears in three features, namely impersonal Brahman, localized super soul, and ultimately the supreme personality of Godhead Krishna. The cosmic manifestation is the gross material body of the supreme personality of Godhead, who enjoys the taste of the material mellows by expanding his parts and parcels, the living entities, who are qual qualitatively one with him. The supreme personality of Godhead, however, is situated in the Vaikuntha planets, where he enjoys the spiritual mellows. Therefore, the one absolute truth, Bhagavan, pervades all by his material cosmic manifestation, the spiritual Brahman effulgence, his personal existence as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, pervades all by his material manif cosmic manifestation, the spiritual Brahman effulgence, and his personal existence as the Supreme Lord. So Krishna actually doesn't enjoy material mellows, but his expansions, the living entities do. That's us, so-called material mellows, consisting of happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor. And as long as we enjoy this, try to enjoy the material mellows, then we have to remain separate from the actual real mellows. In other words, you can, if you're on, if the boat's pulling out, you have to figure out whether you want to be on the boat, you want to be on the land, you can't be in between. So if we want to enjoy spiritual mellows, then we have to give up the material mellows because material mellows are enjoyed for those who want to give up the spiritual mellows. And if we, give, if we accept the spiritual mellows, then we give up the, the material mellows. Nirbanda, Krishna, Sambande, Yukta, Vairagi, Muchite. So Krishna Khan is very simple. Just do what's ever necessary to fix the mind upon Krishna in devotion and then we can experience spiritual happiness. And if we don't do that, then the result is that we have to enjoy material happiness, which in Kali Yuga is not of a very high quality. And as time goes on, we can see that it becomes less and less. But here he's saying, Brahma is changelessly situated in his own abode. Obviously, Harani Kachipu did not read the Srimad Bhagavatam. If he did, it wasn't a, it wasn't a bona fide edition because he has it all wrong. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on in the universe. Any questions so far? Yes. Two more verses and we'll find out what's really on Haranyakashi Blue's mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not Krishna, let me tell you. <laughs> he didn't chant his rounds before he, <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yes. So, so, uh, Shila, so uh, Lord Brahma did interrupt Narada, but why didn't he interrupt uh, Hirani Kashipu, and uh, Hirani Kashipu glorified him as this supreme transcendental lord. Because Hirani Kashipu is a fool. <laughs> What's the best thing you've learned in school, Prahlad? The best thing I've learned in school, my dear father, is that you're a number one fool. So to try to talk to a, a fool, is they just get angry. Especially Hirani Kashipu is quite prone to anger, so... Brahma didn't want to agitate him any more than he was already agitated. Yes. Another one. 
Hirani uh, Kashipu is flattering Brahma, very laying it, laying it on very thick. Uh, but, uh, and apparently also that's what he wants to become, the, the things he says about Lord Brahma. But um, <clears throat> what's the difference in our prayers or great devotees' prayers when they also um, glorify, when we glorify Krishna? When, uh, of course, one thing that may be about Krishna, it's true, but still we begin always with glorification. Yeah. So how it's different from flattery. Well, Krishna likes love. If it's done lovingly, we can also do it to flatter him. Give me a house, give me a wife, give me a color TV. Om Jai Jagadish Hari. So we can also try it. We also, those who are karmis, karma yogis, they glorify, they do devotional service, more or less to flatter Krishna, expecting some return. And those who are jnanis, they want knowledge. They flatter Krishna, they praise him so they can understand how things are going in the material world, so they can learn, work here and get free from miseries. And those who are devotees, real devotees after nishta, when there is no more material desire to fulfill or very little, therefore they glorify Krishna simply out of love, to please him. Yes. <clears throat> you, you mentioned we cannot expand uh, into you know, three atoms, uh, uh, but in the first canto, uh, Vyasadeva glorifies Narada, and I think somewhere throughout the Bhagavatam, one or two places also, uh, saying that like the sun or like the sky, you are in everyone's heart and you understand what's in everyone's heart. Uh, how that can be understood about Narada? or some great devotees, when they are glorified as, you are in people's heart. Who is glorifying them? Vyasadeva glorifies Narada. In the first Well, place. I imagine because Narada understands by Krishna's mercy what's in his heart, what was in Vyasadeva's heart. So whoever Narada approaches, Krishna will give him the intelligence to understand what's in his heart. So if you're in contact with the super soul, then you can know what's in everyone's heart. Doesn't mean he's all the time, he knows everyone's heart. But if he needs to know someone was in someone's heart, Krishna will tell him. Just like Prabhupada said in one morning walk, he said, I'm not, the, the guru is not God, but he knows whatever Krishna tells him, whatever Krishna wants him to know, that's what he knows. Anything else? Yes. Uh, it's. Um my experience, and I think quite a few devotees have experienced, <clears throat> that uh, the guru or senior devotees understand our heart. Like very frequently, I am really uh, very uh, taken by surprise. I, I think it, it almost seems like you have a camera installed in my room and in my <laughs> it was like read what I think and what I do <laughs> addressing my <laughs> whatever I'm thinking but uh, sometimes uh, we experience the, the disciples experience that oh my guru doesn't understand me he, what he says <laughs> so what uh, makes the difference that uh, sometimes a disciple may think, oh, he, he, he misunderstands me. Yeah, I want this, I want that. He doesn't want to give me what I want, so obviously he doesn't understand me. <laughs> yeah, no one will understand you. And the only people who understand you, such people, is the people who fulfill their desires, and they understand what they really want. But that's not Krishna's position. You know, you can also claim Krishna is not giving me what I want, and therefore, he's obviously asleep or something. Maybe it's Chaturmasi and he's asleep. <laughs> he doesn't understand me. Yeah, Krishna understands you. And whether the guru understands you or not, it's not that every guru knows it. You know, Krishna is equally in touch with the super soul. But whether, whether the guru knows you or not, that's not the point, what you want. The point is whether you know what the guru wants. It doesn't really matter what you want, ultimately. It's what the guru wants, what Krishna wants. If he fulfills what you want, that's material. If you fulfill what the guru wants, what Krishna wants, that's spiritual. 
So the name of our business is not to fulfill people's desires, it's to fulfill Krishna's desires. Yeah. So if I want to feel understood by my um, gurus, shiksha gurus and diksha guru, then uh, I should better try to understand them first or make an effort to understand their desires. Then maybe... Uh, yeah, you, we can't find out who we are until we serve Krishna. Bhakti mam abhijananti yavinyas chasmi tattvataha tato mam tattvato gyatvi va vishite tadanantaram. One can understand me as I am only through the process of pure devotion. And when one act, engages in pure devotional service, he can enter into the mysteries of my understanding. We can't understand our real self apart from understanding Krishna. And we can only understand Krishna through devotion, devotional service. Devotional service means to take shelter of Guru Sadhana and Shastra and become aware of what Krishna wants and serve those desires. Otherwise, we don't make, we will never find out who we really are. We can find out what our mind, we can, we're aware to some extent of what our desires are that we want fulfilled. But that's not the business of spiritual life. If you want to fulfill desires, better go somewhere else. This is not the place to do it. If you want to find, if you go to a grocery store looking for gold, you're in the wrong place. Or if you go to a place where there's gold and you're looking for a carton of milk, you're also in the wrong place. So you have to be, if you have material desires, then you go to a place where you can fulfill them. And if you have spiritual desires, then that's what this is supposed to be about. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Gandharaj Shamad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Pramanande Haribo.